Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this session on gender and trade. My name is Elspeth Ackerman. I am the DPR to the WTO of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and I'm your moderator and time manager for this afternoon. And um, that won't be an easy task, I guess, since uh, the topic of, the ses of this session is rich, both in terms of opportunities as well as in terms of complexities. However, what better session to chair or to moderate for a woman in trade as myself than a, ses a session that touches upon the gender dimension of trade, trade policy and, and trade agreements. That trade is gender neutral proved to be a wrong assumption, but finding the right approach, the best practices and the best rules for ensuring that men and women can equally benefit from trade and will be equally protected from its negative impacts is not easy. When I thought about this session and in my preparations and uh, trying to uh, consider a silver bullet for the question that is uh, on the table today, um, the Tupperware approach came to my mind. Um, and you might look it up uh, because Tupperware we consider uh, you know, these plastic things that you have in your kitchen, and uh, we were just discussing it. Uh, you will find that every brocante and every garage sale at the moment uh, 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 for at least less money than you buy them uh, if you have to buy them new. Um, it's actually a very interesting concept. It was innovative in the 1930s of the last century. It is about training and financing and mentoring women into the business of trade. In the case of Tupperware, it were women selling things to mostly women, women who could afford to um, design and to improve, let's say, the kitchen and the kitchenware. And it might be a bit old-fashioned, and you might also consider it uh, rather, um, well, biased, but it is a metho methodology that, to some extent, is still very apt. We need, if we want to uh, make use of uh, the, 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 the unlocked potential of women in trade, we need um, to have the finance to enable them. We need to train them. And very often, and that is not only, let's say, uh, uh, that goes for women everywhere in every position, not only in trade but also in management, we need mentors and we need people to support us. So um, thank you for being here today, and uh, thank you for participating in this, uh, in this session. We have, um, I would say, we have a team of powerhouses here uh, who will en enlighten you from different perspectives, from the more theoretical point of view, uh, but also from the very practical point of view, best practices, established uh, approaches, but also recently developed instruments and tools to, an order to enable that um, the gender neutrality, which is a positive <laughs> thing uh, uh, in principle, uh, in trade is um, improved in that sense that the gender blindness is transforming into a form of gender sensitivity. And that is needed in this day and age where trade is getting complexer all the time uh, in terms of global value chains, but also when it comes to the digitalization of our economies. So I, I think um, it is a promising one and a half hour we are going to spend uh, with each other. You are highly invited to um, reflect on what is said by the panelists, come up with critical questions, test your own solution and perspective, and um, encourage them a bit to, to enter into a little debate with you, because debating helps, uh, and uh, it helps also to, to find and take on board new approaches or ideas that, well, uh, like the Tupperware uh, approach, 
uh, were a bit odd maybe, but uh, turned out to be rather effectively. Before giving the floor to Debra on uh, my uh, outer left-hand side, I would like to ask Ante to um, introduce uh, one of the core participants of the panel today, Trademark East Africa. Some of you will know it as a very relevant, tra uh, relevant player in trade and cross-border trade and women empowerment in trade, but some of you might not, so we thought we'd take the time and have Ante, as a representative of Trademark East Africa, tell you a bit more about um, the mission and the practices of the organization. So Ante, the floor is yours. Thank you, Elsbeth. Um, of course, very pleased to be here. Um, thanks also to ICTSD for the lovely collaboration uh, in prep preparing this, uh, this session. Uh, indeed, I think everybody knows WTO here and UNCTAD and um, ICTSD, but Trademark, um, since we're also more a regional, regionally based organization, not everybody might know us. So um, we are an aid for trade organization. From Some say we're by now the largest globally. And we just finished our first strategic phase uh, in June this year, um, which was worth $560 million, so quite substantial funding, uh, which we invested in trade infrastructure, uh, ports, borders, even some roads, in trade efficiency, uh, procedures, standards, automation, and finally in helping firms to become export ready. Now, during these last six years, we have attained quite impressive results. We promised our donors and our investors to, to reach time reductions uh, on borders in, uh, and in port transport times. Just to give you a feel, on um, some of our borders, we actually achieved 80% time reduction. So Busia, for example, um, those of you who were here for the, the, the aid review in, was it July? Yes. Yeah, yeah. you might have seen the, the live stream, streaming from Busia. Um, another example on the Mombasa-Kigali corridor, uh, we were able to, uh, to support 70 or even more than 70% time reduction so that really has a major impact on transport, on traders, and we hope in the end also on the consumers. Now, maybe to make a link with what we've been talking about the last few days, and I agree with Elsbeth, we can, uh, I mean, neutrality in, in talking about trade no longer works. I think Arancha was the one who said we need more adjectives. So there's one sustainable trade, that's the one we heard quite often, and I was looking at the picture on your screen if this was linked to sustainability, I hope so. Um, and then there's the, the other one that came back all the time, it's the inclusive trade, of course, uh, and this is probably where we'll be focusing more and more today. So, <clears throat> also, in some of the sessions, um, there were comments that the talk here was too lofty, the trade policy, sometimes they're a bit almost boring and it's words and theories. What we will try to do is talk about these theories today, but how it really impacts, impacts uh, lives of traders and especially women traders here. Uh, let me conclude by uh, giving thanks to the, the Netherlands to be present. They're, for us, at least an important funder for the, for the Women and Trade program, together with DFIT. And uh, we want to um, I tell you how proud we are, actually, that our target was to reach 25,000 women with this program, and that we've already largely exceeded this target. So let me leave it at that, Elsbeth. Thanks, Ante, and uh, let me assure you that we are a proud donor of the program, and if there are any government representatives in the room who have money to spare in the field of aid and trade, let me make a small uh, 
uh, sponsor uh, uh, a speech here because it's really worth your while and uh, you, will, you might be able to find some of the engaged organizations uh, in, in, in Africa in, in, in trade facilitation and, and ask them what a difference it makes when uh, border procedures uh, can be streamlined, uh, not only institutionally, but also in the time perspective. That really uh, leads to a lot of gains for the good of all of us. So having said that and having thanked Ante for, uh, for the introduction of uh, uh, part of uh, let's say the panel uh, establishment, let me turn to Deborah. Uh, you have the, uh, I would say, the complex task of setting the scene and, uh, uh, and also elaborating us. I would like to uh, uh, challenge you a bit to, to do that, to explain the concept of a virtuous circle if you Google virtuous, you will immediately find that it, this is an adjective, uh, uh, usually uh, used for uh, uh, pinpointing habits or qualities of women. And if we need to uh, have a circle that improves on improvements and uh, uh, grows when we do things better, also there we might find a bit more neutral adjective than virtuous. But this is uh, not what I ask of you as, let's say, your closing remark of the session, but this is just a thought. So the floor is yours, Deborah. Bother you, Elspeth, you've caught me out. Yep. As my team say, I am victim to the easy glib phrase, and I can see Karen sitting there glaring at me as we speak. Oh dear, Deborah did it again and said something that isn't quite there. But actually, I will argue that virtuous is rubbish that it refers to women. Virtuous is about a moral approach to life and a moral society and a way, a virtuous circle is where good things reinforce each other. One good thing leads to another and that's what we will argue is the ICTSD philosophy. But I'm going to start by taking, first off, to thank Elspeth in spite of the challenge for taking on this task and, and moderating this session, yes, and being one of a few, a member of one of a few key governments that has really pushed and encouraged us to take this work forward. And I'd also like to say thank you to TMEA, who've actually been our partners for some years in a number of good things, including our work on gender. I'm going to start with a, an equally uh, provocative thing that was thrown at me a few days ago when we had uh, a meeting of our uh, sort of gender advisory group. And uh, in the room with us was uh, Simonetta, uh, Simonetta Zarelli, who's been leading gender work in UNCTAD for about seven years now. And, uh, you know, we, we were going round and round, and at some point Simonetta said in a rather challenging way, you know, this is just like history all over again. What is going to make this current round of work on gender so much more effective than what she and I remember from about 20 years ago here in Geneva. So that really made me think and confront our program and confront our thinking and what I'm going to say right now. So to start off with, I would say, firstly, the world has changed. So um, there are a number of factors that make the need to understand gender and to make the effectiveness of looking at gender in different ways more effective now and more necessary. The first one is that the story of gender is a tale of inclusion. And I would argue that, in fact, the whole of the SDGs are really about inclusion in different ways, not just... Um, SDG 8 on, on inclusive growth, but in fact all of them are about in some way making the world a more effective place by bringing in some part of society that is not fully equally at the table. And um, I think the first point to make is that the whole issues of the, the, the various SDGs is the way in which they connect and support each other to make what I would call a virtuous circle. So when we work on making trade policy more gender sensitive or, or whatever, at the same time by including women, 
in a, a, to a greater degree or giving more opportunities, we are having an impact on education because we all know what happens particularly in poorer countries when women earn more is they invest more in the education of their children. Now that's just one example, but we see all over. In fact, I need not repeat yet again these wonderful McKinsey um, uh, studies that say that something like, what was the difference in 2025? Annual GDP increased by something like 28 trillion or some totally ridiculous figure. Point is, we all know this stuff, okay? The more you empower women, the more economic growth you get. You can address poverty more effectively. You get a more inclusive uh, economic growth, obviously. You address inequality. You get a better health outcome. You get a better education outcome. All that blah, blah. All of it works to reinforce the others, to create a society where everybody is included to a greater degree. So that's one thing that's different. The global look at that is different now to what it was 20 years ago. The second thing that is different now is we see the structure of trade, because at the end of the day, we're here in this building to talk about trade. It's all very nice to talk about SDGs in general, but we're going to look at a trade approach here because we understand the role of trade and trade policy in giving effect to these SDGs. Now, we understand that a lot of the structure of trade these days is around value chains. And value chains have particular characteristics that also affect how we see gender equity. We did some studies, uh, one of the early studies that ICTSD did on the issue of gender was looking at the gender dimensions of, um, of value chains. And it makes an interesting dynamic lens for looking at how jobs are structured, where jobs can go, and what are the kinds of barriers that many women face in terms of social structures, in terms of gender stereotypes in different jobs, in terms of the way uh, particularly um, women-owned firms or women-engaged firms in developing countries can enter into a value chain and move up and, and uh, develop greater value, etc. So that's something else that has changed that begs a slightly different approach. The third thing that's very important that has changed from 20 years ago is the growth of the digital economy and the role of services within the economy. And there again, we see very particular structures that affect women differently and offer different opportunities and different challenges. It's very easy, and I must have heard it I don't know how many times at this public forum and in previous places, oh, the digital economy offers all these opportunities for women. Oh, yeah? That may be so in some places, but not so in other places where women face unequal access to education, for example, or other barriers in society. So it bears looking at. You know, I'm from ICTSD. What do we do in ICTSD? We think and analyze and work and do intellectual work. So what I'm doing here is teeing up a whole research agenda of work that needs to be done, simply because that is what, what we do, is we try to find solutions by really understanding problems. And lastly, of course, there's an issue of the way trade agreements are structured. So we see that uh, there's a proliferation of regional trade agreements. And this also adds another dimension for how we could possibly go ahead to address the issue of gender and trade policy. So that's the reason I put forward, the reasons I put forward as to why it is so important now and why we can see more clearly now what we need to do in order to have effect. Now, next thing is to say, what are the shortcomings we see? So we see a number of shortcomings. If we do a little stock taking of what's going on, well, we see that some people are doing fabulous work on the ground and there needs to be more of it. And we're going to hear about some of that from Gloria in a minute or two. And this is great. ITC also and other, many other agencies are doing really interesting, empowering work on the ground to enable women to enter uh, the economy more successfully but there always needs to be more. The second thing we need is more gender disaggregated data. Data is missing as to really try to, we need data to do better analysis, really to understand where and how problems are arising and they can be addressed. Now, data is really part of another issue which builds upon data, which is the need for good empirical evidence. The best policy is based on empirical evidence, so it's evidence-based policy going forward. Now, here we're going to hear from Chiara some of the excellent work that UNCTAD's been doing in this area. But again, we need more of it. 
And then finally, I would argue that we need more conceptual thinking. We need more of research and thinking as to how these things can happen, how can we work it through in the crafting of trade agreements and in the development of uh, regulation. So those are the sort of big picture problems. We then took a look at it at ICTSD from understanding the different dimensions in. Uh, Elspeth, do I have another three or four minutes? Okay, okay, I haven't got my phone here, but thanks. So, okay, we then took a look at it as what are the different levels and dimensions of trade policy engagement. Bear in mind now with ICTSD, we're limiting ourselves down to trade policy. We're, we're not dealing with actual trade on the ground, that's, that's, that's beyond us. So at the first level, we look at the domestic level. And here we see there needs to be a lot more work to be done in understanding the impacts of policies and regulations within country. Because this, it's like the whole thing that, um, that Elspeth was referring to about, oh yes, trade policy is blind, is what people still say sometimes, believe it or not, or regulation. The regulation in the services sector, financial regulation or whatever, is, is gender blind. Sorry, not good enough. You need to understand, because of the underlying circumstances, social, legislative, uh, the, the, the gaps in access to capital, the gaps in access to education, the gaps in access to so many things, the time poverty women face, gender stereotyping, these regulations may not have an equal impact, and those impacts need to be understood if we can proceed to the next step, which is thinking differently about the process of developing policy and domestic regulation. I was uh, making a presentation at uh, another session yesterday morning early talking about regulation in the services sector. And as I was preparing for that, I'd gone through all the traditional things of saying regulation needs to be accountable, it needs to be proportionate, and it needs to be et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, you know what I haven't mentioned in here? is that we need to be thinking through the sustainability, the SDG dimensions as we create regulation, in addition to being transparent, accountable, and proportionate. This is really important. So I argue also that we need to think through the process of generating regulation, making that more inclusive, perhaps different kinds of consultation, etc. cetera, in, in, um, and that will lead us to my fourth point at the domestic level, which is interconnectedness with other policy objectives. So that you know, there's a, an interconnection of regulation with, with those uh, objectives. That's part of the virtuous circle, again, if I may say so. At the, <laughs> thank you. The second level, of course, is looking at trade agreements and um, where we're going there and where we can go there. Now, there has been some interesting evolution on that of late. We've seen that um, uh, in the, uh, there's a chapter on gender in the Chile, Chile Canada agreement, and now with Chile and Uruguay, and uh, we found also in some little research a clause in the Cotonou agreement, which is quite interesting because that goes back a while, that refers Thank you, Elspeth, I'll speed up. That refers specifically to gender, but these really look at how there can be collaboration to work on the subject of gender. They don't take the step further to understand exactly how that agreement can be not gender blind, not gender sensitive, but gender responsive, and think that through. So then, again there, there needs to be work to understand the impacts of trade agreements in gender terms, and secondly, to look at the process of generating agreements. Finally, getting to the, the, the point here very quickly, is the third dimension is what about here in Geneva? Thankfully, I don't need to say too much about that because Anusha is going to be speaking soon, but we have seen tremendous evolution here too. We've seen the WTO appointing a gender focal point, we've seen the Geneva Gender Champions and the formation of this um, working group, that uh, the Trade Impact Working Group, which is developing some sort of an agenda. And what we as, as ICTSD propose to do with our little coordination group is, is three things. Develop a research agenda that can support that and support all these other dimensions provide some visibility to things that are happening here in Geneva, and thirdly, to engage in some regular dialogue. I encourage you all, if you're interested, please be in touch with us. We'd like to include you as we work forward on this important issue. Thank you, Elspeth.
No, and, and thank you very much, uh, Deborah. I think uh, this is actually a very good scene setter, and I'm tempted to have a look around the room whether there is already a question that is of great importance to have answered before we go into the next part of, of the panel. So, not at the moment. So, in principle, I mean, you made a very good case. So uh, no, no, no questions in this room, which is positive. But uh, I challenge you people because um, I think that Deborah was very clear that unlocking the potential of uh, uh, women entrepreneurship is a business case. But I think she also made very clear that uh, whereas the why uh, is 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 evident uh, the how is uh, is not so uh, not so easy to answer um, but we have good examples and uh, gloria of uh, uh, trademark east africa uh, um, manager of the women and trade regional program for the east african community will uh, show them to us. And I think, Gloria, you were planning to do that by a, f by a short film. You would like that is after the presentation. So can I please invite you to take the floor? Uh, thank you very much, Elspeth. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, like we've said earlier, we're going to share some of the practical things that we've done to actually address the challenges that women face in trade. Um, from a perspective of an uh, actual woman trader in the East African community, we'll look at how it all happens uh, on the ground. So we'll, we'll actually look at uh, the life of Alice Njoki. Alice is actually a trader at Malaba, which is one of the borders between Uganda and Kenya. She's been trading for over seven years, and uh, in, uh, uh, she trades in, in some merchandise. Uh, her inventory is about $600, which is really high above the average, but that's because she's been in this trade for, for a couple of years, and she's what you'd actually consider a professional cross-border trader. But she does represent uh, the reality of several other traders across the East African community. So as trademark, why, why is this important to us, and why is it important to work with cross-border traders? Just from the sheer numbers, we know that 70% of all traders actually are women. And so we can't have to talk about uh, inclusive and sustainable traders, as been mentioned earlier, without um, considering the issues that uh, concern women. But also, cross-border trade is a, is a main source of income for uh, many of these women cross-border traders. 90% depend on this as a primary source of income. And as has been mentioned earlier, sorry, I don't know why this keeps flipping back. And as been mentioned earlier, how do these women actually spend the income that they earn? I think Deborah touched on this. A lot of this income is spent on education, uh, on food, but also on health care, which is a significant amount of how this money is invested and therefore directly impacts poverty and welfare at the household level. But also women have a key role in food security in the East African community because 44% 40, of these women actually trade in staples. And that is actually one of the core things around food security in the region. So this is the reason why we have to focus on these because they play a significant role in trade. So if we look closer at Alice and the, and the kind of network that she has, Alice is considered an informal trader because her value is below $2,000 as defined in the simplified trade regime. But if you look at the nature of how she actually engages in trade, it's a very significant network. She works with her family. She works with other traders in the region. She even sources supplies as far as uh, the capital city, which is in Kampala, Nairobi, which is almost 300 kilometers away from the border. And so she has a very wide trading network. And so if you work with a trader like Alice, you have a, an impact beyond her family but actually across an entire ecosystem. And this network, unfortunately, is lost on too many policymakers because um, by definition, she falls under what you would call an informal trader. And so many of the statistics and the policies don't actually have a consideration of this kind of trading system. Um, but Alice is one of the successful cases that we've had, but there are very many challenges that have been faced by women 
across the ESC. Some of them have already been highlighted here. But I'll share just a few. There's still an issue of harassment um, in many forms. Sometimes it's bribery, sometimes it's intimidation. Um, but a lot of this is as a result of uh, lack of sufficient knowledge regarding the trading systems and procedures that are in place. Uh, there's also an issue that I sort of touched on earlier, which is the issue of time poverty. Uh, as we may know, women have other roles in society, and so they have less time to engage in trade compared to their male counterparts. But also there's an issue of um, access to market information. For a woman, because of uh, having fewer networks than her male counterparts, it becomes very costly to actually find access to a market for the commodities that she's selling. So these are some of the challenges that are faced by women uh, across the East African community. So I'll share a bit on what Trademark does to address some of these challenges. Uh, we have a huge focus on advocacy, and really this is around implementation of policy. So we have some great policies in place, like the simplified trading regime, but the extent of implementation varies from one partner state to the other. And so we're involved in a lot of advocacy around this. Um, we've also come together to, to form associations for women traders, because before they've been very fragmented, so they're not able to actually come to the decision-making table and influence policy. And so a huge focus on building institutions uh, to provide a platform for engagement. Uh, also, Trademark, as uh, Anthony mentioned earlier, is, is involved in a lot of infrastructure work. But we also seek to ensure that this infrastructure is responsive to gender. So is it safe for women to cross? Is there security? Is there sufficient lighting? Something as simple as sanit sanit uh, good sanitation can make a difference for a woman cross-border trader as she does her trade. Uh, in access to information is a big thing. Many of the challenges of trading informally are as a result of no information. So we have a, few, a huge focus on in enabling access to information through resource centers, through an SMS platform, and through various other channels. But I'll, I'll um, draw your attention to two specific initiatives that are very new in the East African community and that have trademark has supported. One of these is the decentralization of certificates of origin. This again applies to the simplified trade regime, which is a policy framework to support uh, small and informal cross-border traders. Uh, so this is initially done, originally done by customs officials, but now they have decentralized that to associations of women traders. And this makes a huge difference because First of all, it's a, it's, a, it's a recognition of the significance of having uh, women trade in these particular locations. Sorry. Um, uh, sorry about that. But also, it's a... Uh, it's just flipping. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's also an incentive for women to move from informal and illegal routes back to the main borders because in associations they're more comfortable so they'll come through they'll be able to get the certificate and cross and this is a certificate they use every time they cross the border so this has we've actually had an impact of that it results in cost savings time savings but also in the safety because if someone is going through bushes or a river to get her goods across the uh, across the border there's a very big risk not just to her her physical well-being, but also in terms of losses. Uh, the second initiative uh, I'd like to share today is a cross-border traders charter. This is a, a document that uh, formalizes the rights and responsibilities between border officials and traders. And this is the first time in East Africa we've had this kind of documentation where, as you'd say, the rules of the game are actually documented and signed to. So this is a, a one way to actually hold uh, the different parties accountable in terms of who does what at the borders, but also it's a means to increase transparency. A lot of the bribery that happens at borders is because the, there's no clarity in the processing between one, one side of the border to the other. And so this charter will be very instrumental in ensuring that there's transparency, but also as an incentive, again, to bring women off the illegal routes back to the formal channels. This has been done at one border uh, called Mirama Hills, which is between Uganda and Rwanda. And we're gonna scale this up to several other borders in the region. 
Uh, again, as many of us are aware, there's uh, been conflict in some of the partner states in the ESC, particularly in Burundi and South Sudan. And so we've also uh, tried to address some of this because you know, women are, m are more vulnerable in a conflict situation uh, than in the other partner states. But also, trade is not an option for these women because it's a means of survival. Uh, in South Sudan particularly, there's actually no production of food. They actually import everything that they use. And so the, if you really have to survive, you have to engage in trade. But of course, the risks are there, and these women have proved to be very resilient. We try to design, to design programs to empower them to actually engage in trade. But also something that has really been very exciting for us is that we found that they're actually able to also export. There are some natural products that grow in South Sudan, like share and honey. And so we've uh, worked with the women to actually enable them to, for the first time to actually export and sell to the neighboring countries, as opposed to always having to be on the importing side. And the impact in this uh, South Sudan program has been amazing. We've really seen these women actually increase their incomes from by more than 40 percent. And so this is a, a feel of what's been happening in the East African community with trademark support. And just to give you sort of the headline results, sorry, this slide is not very clear, but um, significant increase in uh, the number of women coming through the trade, formal, formal trading uh, routes, out of the, the illegal routes, uh, from about 1,600 three years ago to over 13,000 uh, as per today. Uh, also significant increases in income from cross-border trade uh, over a hundred percent recorded in the sample that we did. And this again, as I said earlier, speaks to the impact directly on education, on health care, and on food security of the families that they support. Uh, uh, there's been a significant reduction in the cases of harassment, again, because many of them are now empowered, they know their rights and responsibilities. The border officials are now more responsive and recognize uh, the role of women cross-border traders. And so there's been a reduction in uh, the cases of harassment, but also in, in terms of saving costs, because women are longer trading in small, fragmented groups or as individuals. They're coming together, working in cooperatives, working together, bulking their goods, which increases their access to markets, and also the value that they gain from trade. So I will um, conclude by sharing with you a short video from... Uh, Oh yeah, if you could uh, put on your earpieces, please, so that you can actually hear. It's a video from the beneficiaries of uh, some of the work that we do. Some three women years, three years back, women cannot approach to pass at through the gate. We used to pass through those routes, whereby sometimes they can even confiscate your goods. But right now, every woman can approach to pass through the gate. Trademark East Africa has helped us, especially on business skills mostly. We now know how to do business. When Trademark came in, we are hosted under the OSPB. We have chance to get an office. Women no longer suffer. Traders no longer suffer. They come up to the office to get trade information from our office. Imenifunza, ata wafanya kazi wangu, pia nina walipa juni haki yao. Kwa hivyo tuliona, tukiwa tunajua mambo na kubalance vitabu, kumbe, Tunajua hakuna pesa ambayo inaenda nje. Nilikuwa napenda kupitia sile panya route sakando kando lakini nilifundishwa na EAC ya kwamba nipitie kwa boda. Now we have skills on business. Whereby most women are now coming up as entrepreneurs. Every woman have a business. We are making money. We have empowered. We, we know our rights. We know what we can do. We know where we can pass. Yes, it came and empower women and enlighten women. They train us about custom procedures. They train us about business management. They train us how we can interact with the government officials. As a woman, mm. through EAC and Trademark East Africa, 
a very happy woman. Uh, yeah, so in conclusion, we've worked with, uh, we've worked at seven different borders at, in the East African community, but of course there's still a lot to be done. There are thousands of women who get into cross-border trade every single day. And so we're looking to scale up this work, uh, hopefully in the next uh, five or so years to reach at least half a million women. And there's still a lot of work, a lot of partnerships to work with, both with the private and public sector for us to achieve this vision. So that's it, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, uh, Gloria, for, um, for these inspiring examples of uh, the work that you are doing and the way that you empower women to, to enter into trade. And um, I think what is good for women is good for business and, and vice versa. I think that is uh, pretty much uh, the essence of, of the video and, and your presentation. Um, I'm just having a look around. Are there any questions at the moment for Gloria in relation to the facts and the figures uh, that she shared with you or any of the female entrepreneurs that are doing their business in very different circumstances than at least the people who live and work here in Geneva. And if that is, yeah, please ma'am, maybe you can state your name and your organization so that we know that whom we're talking to. Thank you. Uh, my name is Aisha, representing Pakistan. Um, very interesting presentation. I uh, would um, like to know that uh, in terms of bringing the change, um, in terms of uh, attitudinal change, um, what has been uh, your experience uh, through these initiatives that what was the major um, thing which brought an attitudinal change, for example, in terms of uh, custom officials or, you know, um, the public uh, servants where women have to go and get uh, the services. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, one of the main things we did was work with the champions, if you could call it that. So in the associations, we have, of course, leaders who manage the association. So we found that it's very powerful when women hear the story from a fellow woman. So if they see somebody who used to smuggle goods and use an illegal route and then come back to the main border and is still trading profitably, this is, it works to influence the rest of the response and that has grown over the years. From the border side, from the border officials side, we've engaged in training, a lot of training on uh, gender responsiveness and um, the, imp the, the impact that that would have on women traders. But also, in, like somebody said earlier, in sharing the evidence that there's actually a change that will happen if you encourage women to come through the main borders. So that has been our main approach by using women leaders as champions within the, um, amongst their peers, but also directly sensitizing the border officials to create an enabling environment for women to trade. Can I answer that? Uh, of course, Anta, go. Thank you, Elspeth. Maybe to, to add a bit more, um, what Trademark has been doing in the region is actually creating a whole ecosystem of, of stakeholders and partners. It means that you, when you work, for example, at Busia, the picture you, you saw, we, we built a new building, new road, etc. So there's nice, lovely infrastructure, which makes it nicer for custom officers to sit there and also for women to pass. And then we look at the procedures. But we just don't work with that only individual officer. We also work with the minister and with even the presidents of the region. And so we try to really get the buy-in top down. So there's not one, there's that one individual custom officer that is going to say, ah, I'm not going to collaborate, you know? So it's that whole ecosystem. So first top down and then also bottom up, as Gloria says, with training, with engaging with, with the individual. So you see that whole ecosystem has been extremely beneficial. Thank you very much, uh, Isha, for, uh, for that excellent question. I think we all know that uh, paper has more patience than people. So whatever we tell and whatever we show people uh, needs to be uh, in, well, taken up in, let's say, uh, uh, the mentality and, and the actual 
doings of, of, of the people that uh, either do business or facilitate business at, at borders. So thank you for touching upon, let's say, the human factor in, in, in this. Um, speaking about men, yes for this um, very interesting presentation. I'm Madeleine Tarnica from um, the European Commission. Um, what, what I understand from your presentation is that actually there was a pool of women who wanted to do this. They, they had to do it secretly and, and in a hidden form, and what the project does, it, it facilitates this. And I think that for the overall debate, that, that type of identification is extremely important. Um, we, we are really very much in the in the research stage in uh, within within the EU, and one of the things that our um, economist unit did is to see um, how many women in Europe participate in trade. And actually, women are in the services sector and in particular in the public sector. They participate very little in the in trade. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no potential, but what that subsequently put to us as a question is, is there a huge untapped potential? I don't know whether the, there's lots of women in Europe wanting to do trade, whether like, like what you say is we needed to facilitate the cross-border trade and make sure that women could actually legally trade. So it, I think it would be very interesting to know that, that is that potential there and how do you know that and how did you know that in these projects? Uh, thank you, that's a very good question. So before we start the project, obviously we go and do mapping. We uh, con conduct a survey, not just in the po border population, but also in the urban cities, because of course the trade is all interrelated. And also we look at the statistics that are being collected by the border officials in terms of utilization, like uh, Anthony mentioned, about of the border actual infrastructure facilities. And so we found that the numbers of women coming through were significantly less than their male counterparts. And so we try to understand why. Mm -hmm. And when we, if we look at the challenges, uh, some of the statistics in the challenges, we found that about 67, or, or about 60% just did not know about it. They were not knowledgeable. So they were like, when they understood that there's an, in, an, an incentive for them, there's a, a regime that uh, supports small scale traders, then they start to respond. Um, Around the border communities, it's easier because they naturally trade from one side of the border to the other. But like you've mentioned, they were doing it using the back routes, using the going through bushes and rivers, because they thought if they came through the main channel, they'll be taxed or harassed, which was actually happening in some borders. So it's just that continual sensitization, and then the natural pe people naturally respond to opportunity, and then they'll go out and say, if I can buy something at a lower price and sell it at a higher price across the border, then it makes business sense. So you start to see gradually more responses. But also some of this trade is uh, determined by the, especially in the staples, by the seasonality of uh, production across the East African borders. So usually it's also as a result of demand for food and other staples that you, ha you see a natural, uh, people responding to look for opportunities to trade to bridge the gap between one country and another. So it's, it's a gradual process, and it's a result of several factors. But primarily, it's information. Information is usually what people respond to. Once they know there's an opportunity, and they know they can make some money out of that, they won't, they won't be harassed or exploited, then they'll respond. Thanks, Gloria, and thank you, Madalena, for that uh, uh, excellent question. Let's move on. Uh, on to refer to uh, 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 um, ecosystem uh, to um, uh, support and encourage business and, and the enabling environment. Uh, these are beautiful words, but also rather containerized concepts. And uh, UNCTAD, uh, uh, the actually only organization who has trade and development in its official mandate. Uh, a lot of organ other organizations are working on the topic, but the UNCTAD is, uh, is doing it officially, uh, has developed uh, a very interesting instrument to help establish that enabling environment and that ecosystem. And Chiara, sitting next to me, will um, tell you a bit more about that instrument uh, in uh, the next 10 minutes or so. 
Chiara, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Asbeth. Thank you very much for, for coming here today. Um, today I'm going uh, to present uh, an instrument that has been uh, recently developed at uh, UNTAD. It was actually launched last July with uh, the support of uh, Sweden. And the purpose is indeed to make available an instrument that can help make trade more equitable and specifically help uh, um, close the gender gap and support women's uh, um, empowerment. So today I would like to provide uh, an overview of uh, the content of this uh, instrument in order to be able to appreciate uh, the methodology and the framework uh, that is associated with it and then briefly also present uh, a case study which is uh, the first uh, case study to which uh, we um, applied uh, our, our instrument uh, which is the case of, uh, of Kenya. Let me see if the presentation works. Okay. So what is uh, this instrument? It's called uh, the Trade and Gender Toolbox. Uh, and represents the first uh, attempt uh, to provide uh, a systematic uh, framework uh, in order to be able uh, to anticipate uh, the impact uh, of uh, trade reforms uh, to um, the degree of gender inequality in a country and specifically the impact on women's well-being. So the, gender and, and the trade and gender toolbox uh, allows uh, for answering the following question. What would happen to women if uh, a given trade policy were implemented? So what is important to emphasize is that this uh, instrument needs uh, to be applied to a specific country and to a specific uh, agreement. And in order to do so, we need uh, good data. And uh, this uh, goes back uh, to the discussion previously about uh, the importance uh, to have available uh, gender disaggregated, uh, disaggregated data in order to be able to understand uh, the impact uh, of, uh, of trade reforms. And our um, trade and gender toolbox has been applied to Kenya as a first case study because indeed the country has uh, uh, good gender disaggregated data that we can, uh, uh, we can use. Um, once uh, we have answered this question, uh, we, can, uh, um, we can see whether we need uh, to introduce uh, corrective measures. So if uh, we would, uh, were to answer that question based on our results, uh, um, that a certain trade uh, policy has uh, a detrimental impact on women, corrective measures uh, can be put in place. And uh, the Trade and Gender Toolbox uh, also provides uh, guidelines in order to put in place effective policies uh, to uh, prevent uh, negative effects on women or to support uh, positive effects in case uh, a certain trade reform were to be associated with a positive uh, um, effect. Now, why do we need uh, the Trade and Gender Toolbox? Uh, given the conversation <coughs> we, we have had so far, we don't really need uh, to enter into the, the details uh, of uh, uh, the reasons why this is important. Uh, this is just a summary uh, in order to emphasize uh, that trade policy indeed has uh, uh, gender effects that are uh, different for men and women. And also women actually would need to be considered in different roles uh, as employees, uh, as producers, uh, consumers, and taxpayers. So if we had uh, good and broad data, actually we could uh, be able to understand uh, the impact of certain trade reforms uh, on women considered in, uh, in, different, uh, in different roles. So we need uh, to, uh, to be able to understand uh, the multiple uh, impact on, uh, on gender based on the different roles that women have on the economy or potentially can, uh, can have in the economy. Uh, this is important uh, both for equity reasons and for long run uh, growth. So it matters uh, for uh, a human rights perspective, but also to increase uh, productivity and so to support uh, long run growth. As we said, uh, um, more um, women's empowerment is associated with uh, better investment in, uh, in education, uh, with the family planning, uh, uh, development in agriculture, and so on. So overall, uh, this is uh, important for both uh, equity reasons, but also for strict economic reasons uh, um, as well. Um, the gender impact uh, is always a country specific and this also goes back to why we develop an instrument uh, that uh, indeed needs uh, to be applied uh, to specific uh, cases. The gender impact of a certain trade policy depends on the context uh, that we have under, uh, under consideration. And the, gender and trend, uh, the trade and gender toolbox uh, provides uh, the, the instruments uh, to be able to make uh, this ex-ante um, evaluation. 
typically we end up with the two scenarios. So we have a certain country under consideration, a certain uh, trade uh, reform that is under consideration. We run our um, methodology and we end up typically with two results. So either the trade, um, the trade reform is associated with uh, um, positive uh, effects, so we can put in place uh, good supportive policies, or otherwise we end up with uh, a negative scenario in which uh, gender inequality quality is expected to increase, uh, and so we can put in place uh, complementary measures uh, that help uh, uh, reduce uh, um, the negative effect. Now, to enter a little bit more into the details uh, of uh, the, the toolbox, the toolbox is made of uh, four components. Uh, it follows uh, a stepwise approach. The first uh, uh, component is called uh, identification and uh, is a descriptive uh, component. So in the first step, we want uh, to evaluate what is uh, the gender profile of a certain country. So we use uh, survey data, we use uh, uh, legal text, uh, we gather all the evidence that we have available in order to understand what are the different dimensions of uh, gender inequality in, uh, in a country. Then we move to the second step, which is evaluation. This is where we use our methodology, which is a general computational model, which is an instrument that is used in order to be able to evaluate the impact of a certain trade reform on different sectors in, in the economy. At the end of the second step, we have uh, what is called a matching uh, um, step, in which we put uh, together the results of the first step and the second step. So we are able, at the end of the second step, uh, to see whether the sectors uh, that are expected to be impacted uh, by a certain trade reform are relevant uh, for, for women, primarily through employment. Given data availability, uh, at the moment, we have been able actually to look at the impact for women through employment. So once we understand whether these sectors that are impacted by the trade reform are sectors that are female intensive or not, then we can move to the following step, which provides a checklist and a monitoring framework. The checklist provides uh, guidelines uh, in order to be able to indeed uh, guide the policymakers uh, in putting in place uh, measures uh, that are supportive of women's empowerment. So if we end up uh, with uh, a certain result in step two, saying that a certain trade reform actually is uh, associated with positive effects for women, the checklist can be used to potentially introduce policies that make these positive effects even uh, bigger in magnitude, or if we end up with negative um, results in the second step, the, the checklist can, can guide the, the policymaker to actually help women's uh, um, condition. Um, and then finally, as a last step, we, um, we have uh, built uh, uh, an indicator, which is uh, essentially a synthesis uh, of uh, the entire uh, methodology, which uh, helps uh, follow uh, the gender employment gap and trade openness uh, over time, so that we are able to look at the development over time of uh, um, women's, uh, um, in, uh, women's condition in the workplace and the degree of trade openness. And if there is time, we can enter into the details on how to calculate these, uh, uh, these two indicators. But this uh, is uh, helpful in order for the policymaker in order to follow over time mm -hmm. how gender inequality develops, uh, while at the same time uh, also monitoring the degree of uh, trade openness. This, uh, um, this indicator is not uh, meaning to point at any causality between gender inequality and trade, but wants to evaluate how these two dimensions evolve over time. Um, now, briefly, if I have time, um, I'm going to show our results if we apply this uh, uh, toolbox to the case of Kenya. We look at the case of Kenya um, in the context of the Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, which has been discussed for uh, three years by now, and the future of this agreement is still uh, uncertain. Um, so we are going to evaluate how this agreement, if it were to be put in place, would impact the economy in Kenya, and in particular how it would uh, impact the condition of uh, women. 
So following uh, the um, stepwise approach we described earlier, as a first step, we, um, we make our descriptive analysis. And so based on the evidence that we have available, it turns out that the women actually uh, are in a condition of uh, inequality in many different dimensions. Only when we look at primary education, uh, there is no inequality because of uh, uh, compulsory education uh, when it is about uh, primary education in, in Kenya, Whereas in all other dimensions, uh, we see that there is uh, a quite a significant gender gap, which is indicated in, uh, um, in red uh, in, um, in this slide. Um, the second step provides uh, the quantitative results. So based uh, on uh, our estimations, uh, we are able to evaluate what sectors uh, are um, more significantly impacted by the uh, implementation of DPA. Now, in order to be able to uh, evaluate the impact of a certain agreement, we need to compare the situation uh, in the context of this agreement with an alternative. So in the case of Kenya, we look at uh, how the condition of women in Kenya would be under the EPA with respect to an alternative, a counterfactual, which is uh, the GSP, the Generalized System of Preferences, which would be in place in Kenya if the EPA were not to um, to, uh, to get adopted. So these, uh, uh, these uh, graph uh, plots our main results. Uh, we have on the vertical axis uh, the share of uh, women's employment, uh, so sectors are ranked uh, based uh, on uh, women's uh, participation. And uh, on the horizontal axis, instead, uh, we have uh, the expected change in uh, labor demand uh, under the APA with respect to the counterfactual, uh, the GSP. So if we end up uh, being on uh, the right of our zero, it would mean that actually we have a positive impact. If we are on the left of zero, instead it is a negative impact. Um, based on our results, we are able to see that actually uh, sectors would be uh, impacted uh, uh, differently. The, there would be a positive impact only on agriculture, which actually is excluded from uh, the impact of the EPA because uh, agricultural products are part of the, the, the sensitive product list. Manufacturing would be negatively impacted. The sectors that are more negatively impacted, uh, chemicals and furniture, are not sectors that are particularly relevant for women's employment. However, other manufacturing sectors would be negatively impacted as well, even though by a lower uh, a lower margin. So overall, we see that women in Kenya would not be um, affected particularly, um, the, the impact on women would not be particularly significant in the case of the APA, but uh, mostly the impact would be negative. So there is a space actually to put in place measures that can be uh, good for women's uh, um, um, the, there is space to put in place uh, policies uh, that can be good for women. So the third step, uh, the checklist, uh, provides uh, um, a guide for the, um, the government in Kenya to introduce uh, corrective measures. So corrective measures uh, can be introduced in different areas. So in our report, actually, we discuss uh, uh, other sectors with respect to what is uh, presented in, uh, in the slide as well. So export promotion measures uh, or measures uh, supporting uh, sectors that are in competition uh, with foreign producers. In this case, uh, we look at uh, what would happen uh, to uh, welfare. So if uh, government uh, revenue would uh, 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 where to fall uh, following uh, the adoption of the, the EPA, uh, what would happen to public services, uh, how women would be affected, if uh, taxation were to increase, uh, how would many women be affected by this uh, change in taxation. So essentially we introduce questions uh, that the government would need to actually keep in mind in order to make sure that the measures that are introduced are actually uh, positive for, uh, for gender equity. Um, then, uh, as part of the, of the third step, uh, that before I didn't actually discuss in details, is a monitoring framework. Uh, so essentially, we provide uh, some indicators uh, that can be calculated uh, before the adoption of a certain agreement, uh, so before the APA here, and uh, afterwards as well. And the idea is actually to calculate uh, these indicators over time in order to be able to evaluate uh, how gender inequality changes uh, over, over time. And these uh, can be helpful uh, for 
policymakers as well in order to be able to have a good sense of what is the gender condition in, in the country before introducing policies. And then finally, the, uh, the trade and gender index. So the trade and gender index is calculated as a ratio of the gender employment gap to trade openness. And in this slide, we see that in the case of Kenya, it's being calculated only for agriculture and manufacturing, because these are the, the only two sectors in which um, the, the index can be calculated. The index is calculated per, per sector and per year, so that we are able actually uh, we are able to evaluate the, the index uh, more specifically over, over time and per each uh, specific sector. In the case of Kenya, we see that per, uh, starting from 2013, there has been a deterioration of both uh, trade openness and, uh, and gender equality. So there is actually um, space for, uh, for the government to introduce uh, corrective corrective measures. Then finally to conclude, the toolbox uh, is, uh, um, is uh, intended for, uh, for government but also for practitioners, uh, people that are interested in, uh, um, in gender equality uh, issues. And the purpose is uh, to contribute to make uh, trade more inclusive uh, in line with the 2030 um, Sustainable Development Goals and with the Addis Ababa Action Agenda as well. Thank you. And thank you. I think this is uh, this is very interesting, uh, especially for um, for governments that uh, want to use trade as a driver for uh, economic growth, but also inclusive economic growth. So very useful. Um, would there be an urgent question? Yes, sir. You have the floor. Just a quick addition, thank you very much for this presentation, just to tell you that the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development has just developed a similar toolbox or paper for donor programs to be more gender sensitive in agribusiness and trade. Thank you. And if people want to have a bit more information on that toolbox, they can address you? Yes. Good. Okay, if uh, no other issues at the moment, please let me turn to uh, our last speaker in the panel, but absolutely not the least. Uh, Anoush represents uh, the WTO uh, uh, that has as its, as its core mandate trade and trade liberalization, but every know that everybody knows that uh, in trade uh, the development dimension is at the heart of everything we do. Uh, also in the ongoing negotiations for the 11th ministerial conference of, of this organization. And, uh, Sorry, I'm not talking in the mic. So uh, I was telling you a bit about Anoush and about the WTO uh, that has trade at uh, trade liberalization uh, as its core mandate, but that uh, at that in the core of that mandate is also included I for the development dimension, uh, and that dimension is also at the core of the ongoing uh, negotiations for already the 11th ministerial conference, and she's going to elaborate a bit on um, how the WTO tackles. Um, the gender issue and in an organization that is aiming for a level playing field and non-discrimination I would say that is a, a very important topic so um, Anush the floor is your thank you Elspeth um, yes so I am here as a you know I'm part of the secretary of the WTO secretariat and actually, um, I am the WTO gender focal point. Yes, uh, there is a WTO gender focal point. <laughs> okay, granted, um, I was just nominated a couple of months ago, but uh, still it shows that the WTO is really committing um, at last, if I may say so, uh, to focus on, uh, on gender issues. So I'm going to focus um, on I'm going to, to explain to you what the WTO has done so far on trade and gender, because it has done things. And then I'm, looking in, I'm going to look into the future and explain to you 
in very broad terms because this is still you know uh, a pot that is cooking right now uh, what uh, we we or I will be doing um, in the WTO and where I can bring the WTO uh, on this issue. So basically, um, first of all, I'm going to, to look at trade rules and at a number of areas of the WTO's work um, to show you that actually, um, you know, these will show you that trade can help empower women. Um, so you're going to tell me, yes, so trade rules, well, why are you talking about trade rules? It's quite obvious that there is no specific language on gender. So, you know, uh, that's it. We don't need to talk about this. Well, actually, yes. And if in, even if those trade rules don't really uh, target women specifically, they impact women uh, specifically. It's all quite obvious. So I, I'll just give you a few examples. The first thing that is uh, come to mind is, of course, the trade facilitation agreement. Um, it includes measures uh, to foster um, collaboration between borders. Uh, this can have an impact on women because um, it can lead to opening customs at the same time. Yes, in certain countries, you have customs that don't happen at the same time. Uh, so it can create for cross-border uh, women traders uh, issues um, of security, for example. Um, and of course, this also can lead to, uh, this cooperation can lead to uh, reforming the infrastructure. So maybe adding some lights to the customs premises and stuff like that. So that's, um, uh, the, the, the agreement can or would um, allow a safer environment for women traders. Also, it's particularly beneficial for SMEs, and we know uh, that uh, you know women are very much um, involved in um, you know uh, there is a lot of women that are uh, owning SMEs and doing trade with their with their uh, companies, and of course there are many trade facilitation measures that um, allow uh, that can contribute to a number of SDGs like um, SDGs number nine, where you have access to the internet, uh, SDGs number 16, uh, about reducing corruption and bribery, SDG number eight, and again 16, about formalization and growth of um, um, uh, SMEs. So all of them have a direct impact uh, on women. Um, another thing that, uh, another, uh, other issues that can also have an impact for women is uh, trade-related development decisions. As Elbets was saying, you know, development is at really at the core of our activities right now. And, uh, for example, you can have, um, these decisions can improve uh, women's engagement in uh, international trade, uh, duty-free, quota-free market access for products from uh, LDCs from least developed countries. You have prefer preferential rules of origin. Um, the, the aim is to make it easier for exports from LDCs to qualify from pref for preferential market access. Um, these are good examples of such decisions. Um, also, of course, you know, the current negotiations that are focusing on services or culture can have also quite an impact on women. Now, there are other issues like trade finance, for example. It's also quite uh, essential um, for traders around the world, but also for women traders. Uh, acce in accessing uh, trade finance, this is a, a very difficult issue for, for women. Um, uh, for example, just you know, to, to throw you a figure, um, in Africa, there is an unmet demand of trade finance, which amounts to 120 billion US dollars, so it's quite quite big. Uh, this comes from, by the way, a WTO report on uh, trade finance and SMEs. It's quite in interesting to read if you want to, to have a look. Um, also in the WTO, there are bodies that are dealing with um, gender issues. You have the STDF that is helping women comply with SPS uh, measures. You have the EIF helping women integrate and climb up the value chains. They, they develop uh, trade capacity uh, programs. And there is, of course, Aid for Trade. Uh, Aid for Trade has a gender dimension, a very strong gender dimension, if I may say so. And this is actually quite interesting to look at this because um, Aid for Trade, the initiative 
uh, on aid for trade has a mandate to work on gender, whereas the WTO Secretariat doesn't have a mandate. So I'll come to that uh, in, a, in a second. So actually, there is a, there's been a, um, uh, an increased focus on, on gender in the Aid for Trade uh, work program. Um, and at the Global Review, I don't know if some of you were at the Global Review uh, in July this year, uh, the, you know, gender um, was really a cross-cutting issue uh, during the, uh, the Global Review, which the Global Review is, a, is an event uh, that is a platform, let's say, for the development and trade communities to come together and um, <clears throat> to also show the results um, of uh, the monitoring exercise that we've been conducting on uh, aid for trade uh, programs and activities of donor uh, members and also recipient members. Um, so I'm not going to, to go too much into detail with that. Um, so basically, uh, this is kind of, in very general, uh, what is the WTO has done. Now, what is the WTO going to do? That's going to be quite interesting, actually, and uh, I like the challenge. Because it is going to be a challenge um, um, as Beth was saying earlier, you know, we don't have to ask ourselves why. Uh, the why is evident but uh, the how is not so evident. Actually, the why in the WTO is not so evident. So, <laughs> of course, you know, other organizations like UNCTAD have been working on this. Uh, they can do it officially. <laughs> That's great, you know, I love that. Um, but uh, we're just starting at the WTO. So, um, recently, a group of members tabled a proposal to include gender equality um, in uh, the services domestic regulation uh, 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 negotiation uh, document uh, text. Uh, actually, the, the reaction of the other members was quite, uh, if I may say so, tepid. Uh, you know, to pull it lightly. <laughs> uh, some members have said, uh, why do we need to talk about this in the WTO? Why do we need to talk? about gender in the WTO. Um, again, the idea of, you know, the trade rules are gender neutral, uh, or even I, I heard uh, in another session here in the forum saying that they were intended to be gender neutral. Um, I don't know about that. Um, you know, I don't know that the, the, the negotiators back in the Eurogo round thought about, you know, the impact of the trade rules they were negotiating on women. I don't think they had that in mind at all. Anyway, um, and others were saying, um, yes, okay, um, you know, let's hear what you have to say, but we need uh, data, statistics, uh, to be able to understand why this is important for us, why trade has an impact on, uh, on women. So this is like, you know, I'm sure you had that discussion like seven years ago or even, you know, at UNCTAD. We are having this conversation right now. So it's quite interesting to see, to see that. However, having said that, uh, it's not like, you know, the members are against it. On the contrary, I think members are open to, um, you know, they're not saying it's not a relevant uh, issue. They're just saying that, you know, maybe the WTO is not the right platform to talk about this. So this is also uh, an issue that we have to, uh, to advocate here in the WTO. Um, and again, um, I was uh, talking about you know, this, this question about data. Well, this is one thing that the WTO is going to really uh, focus on. This is one of, the, of, the, of our objective right now is to launch uh, a deeper research analysis to gather data or just even to create new data because this is something which is, um, I've been hearing over and over again, uh, lacking. Um, of course, UNCTAD again, um, you know, and I think we will probably definitely talk again and collaborate, but this is great, you know, but I think, you know, at the WTO level, we really need to look into this more closely. Um, another thing that members are doing right now, uh, they are um, putting forward uh, a declaration for the uh, ministerial uh, um, meeting at the end of the year in, in Argentina. Uh, so this declaration is going to be um, proposed uh, in the margins of the ministerial, so it's not part of the final official uh, document. It's just a group of members, and by the way, it's not just 
developed countries, but it's also developing countries uh, that are you know, taking the lead on that. Um, and the, 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 the content of this declaration is mostly about uh, sharing information, sharing be best practices, um, also using the WTO's uh, processes to do that as well, so to do it also together internally. I think it's quite, it's quite interesting. It's, um, it's, uh, it's, a good, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting move, and I hope that uh, this declaration will gather a lot of uh, signatures. Now, um, I, t I told you about the, the, one of the objectives of WTO is to gather data. Um, another thing is also, I've heard that over and over again also, and here as well at the public forum, there is um, a difficulty in accessing information. Uh, where do I find TBT notifications? Where do I find SBS notification? Where do I find the tariffs uh, in one country? How do I read the list of uh, the, the, this, this kind of these documents, which is called the list of engagement? Um, you know, it's quite complicated and technical. So I think one of the another um, thing that the WTO can do is just also get this information, uh, make it simpler, get it out there, and um, allow um, women to uh, to um, to have access to this information. Um, of course, this is this is another thing for us is to understand what are the different trends, that, what are the different policy trends in. Um, in WTO members, uh, we don't know, we don't have, uh, we don't have any clue about what's, ha you know, what they're doing. So, and there are different processes in the WTO that you can use to do that. You know, of course, there is a trade policy uh, review. There is the aid for trade monitoring uh, process. Uh, you also have, for example, um, you can use, I don't know, uh, for it's just an example, um, accession negotiations to understand what the candidates, um, the candidate countries are, are doing in terms of, you know, gender and trade. So this is also, uh, it's important for us to understand what's happening, uh, you know, in, within member states so that we can also help them or facilitate or, you know, also develop different activities around this. Of course, there is a big aspect about training. Uh, and I'm not talking about just training, um, you know, officials. For example, we have a big technical assistance program that does that. We can include gender issues into that. But of course, we're talking about also training the secretary staff. These are experts. These are trade experts. They are the technicians of trade. And these people go out there. They talk to officials. They talk to organizations. They talk to the media. They need to be trained. Uh, they need to know what they're talking about when they talk about trade and gender. Right. So just to conclude, I think uh, there are things that we shouldn't forget. Um, we've been talking about uh, women owning SMEs, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, women in the in the in the workforce. Actually, I don't know if you followed the World Trade Report launch the other day. Uh, there is a, uh, you know, uh, yeah. there is a chapter on on, uh, on women's work on how trade allows uh, women to to get uh, to get work. I think we also need to, to think about the women that don't work, or they work but they don't get the, you know, they don't get paid for their work. Um, you know, they are, you know, they can we can look at them as consumers. That's one thing, but not only. Um, one, one thing that can come to, to mind is, for example, um, the liberalization of uh, water services. This can have an impact on, on women in, in developing countries because uh, they have the role as uh, water managers, for example. So that could have, you know, we, can, we have to also include all this thinking. Um, and lastly, um, we've been talking a lot about development, but we shouldn't forget uh, women in uh, developed countries. And I will give you a little thing about what happened in Switzerland. It's not related to trade, but I think it's quite, um, you know, relevant. Um, in Switzerland, uh, last weekend there was a, 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 a vote on extending the age of retirement of women. Uh, the population rejected that proposal, and the women uh, that voted no. Uh, they said, it's just one year. I mean, people were saying, it's just one year. Well, you know, what the hell? Well, actually, they said, you know, the day we have wage equality, then we will be willing to increase, uh, you know, to work one more year so that the, uh, the retirement uh, pensions are 
quite well balanced. So that's just an example of you know, how there is still a long way to go. Thank you very much, Anous. Um, well, so much to talk about uh, when uh, speaking about and debating about um, gender and trade. Our focus today was, of course, the position of women in trade and the unlocking of, uh, of, of women potential. Uh, but the other side of trade is, uh, is very much driven by men. And uh, I think it's very important that we acknowledge that trade is a two-way business. It takes two to tango. And uh, uh, we uh, need, let's say, a well-balanced approach in which uh, both men and women have equal potential and, and benefit equally and are protected in an equal way from, let's say, the negative impacts that there are. And I think that is the, the, the premise under which we, we organized this, this session today. Um, we don't have time for uh, uh, other questions, so I'm very happy that you took the opportunity to, uh, to take them in between. Uh, uh, maybe just outside the room, if there are uh, more questions uh, related to the work of uh, Trademark East Africa, uh, Gloria and Anta will, will stay around a bit. Uh, the same, I hope, goes for Chiara um, uh, as regards the, the Angtat toolbox and uh, Anoush probably as well, uh, because what the WTO uh, is doing is actually responding quite proactively uh, uh, on the new insight that trade cannot be gender neutral, especially when you embrace uh, the development dimension of trade and economic growth. Uh, so um, here at the WTO, we need to help the WTO secretariat by giving them a mandate or an assignment. And we means governments, uh, but also civil society re re representatives, representatives that need to push their governments uh, to make that happen. Uh, if we don't ask the secretariat of the WTO, uh, they don't act. Uh, and they want to act, so we need to give them the incentive. And uh, then, uh, last not but not least, uh, Deborah, who set the scene for us, um, I think very worth the while. And it was good of you to to give us the historical perspective, and uh, uh, and 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 tell us a bit more about why, let's say, old approaches don't work in, uh, let's say, the new environment that, that trade is and the ever further growing uh, globalization. So thank you, panelists, very much. Thank you, audience. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, please take time and room outside this room if you want to have a bit further conversation about the topic. And for those traveling back, because not everybody's Geneva-based, have a safe trip. And I hope to see you next year at the WTO Public Forum. Thank you very much.